I've had a bunch of these little NRF 28001 modules around for a while, and I got some more in a mailbag not too long ago. Um, so there's the standard little NRF module, and there is the high-powered one with a little amplifier chip on it. Uh, and this is the little adapter boards that I got not that long ago. I was hoping that this would make these guys breadboard compatible. Um, the reason they aren't breadboard compatible is the two rows of pins. If you put them like that, they're shorted this way. If you put them like that, the pairs of pins are shorted. And the spacing on that won't fit over the gap to separate them. So I ordered some of these little uh, interface modules. Let's just plug on like that. Think, hey, great, it's got a row of pins. And you just make it uh, breadboard compatible. But when they arrived, the pins are going out the wrong side for that. But, so I think, okay, I'll just flip the pins around. However, even with the pins flipped around, there they are in the first row of holes. None of the uh, holes are, are available to do anything with. Or if I were to plug it in that way in the last row of holes again. So these aren't even slightly useful for breadboarding. So you still end up putting long wires on them. Which is kind of annoying, but whatever. Anyway, so I've got those and I've got the radio modules. And I haven't played with these things really at all. Um, I'm actually a little bit intimidated because they are entirely software driven and as I'm sure I've mentioned many times before I'm not that great at code um, I I much prefer physical stuff but I think these are going to come in useful for some projects so I have to get over that so since these things won't come to the breadboard I've had to make the breadboard come to them um, by weighing out the eight pins and let me just grab another one here so we can see what the pins are labeled so the pins are what do you got up there uh, enable uh, or CE CSN clock uh, Mosey Meso and IRQ and then there's VCC and ground over here and you can see them labeled up there as well on the six pins, which doesn't help with the old school modules, but it does help with these. And the pinouts are the same. But regardless, they go off this away here, like I showed you before. Or let me just zoom out a hair. This is a little bit extreme. Um, or in this case, they just go on like that. And where's another one on this one? So the pins that they go to on the Arduinos don't, I mean, they, they sort of matter because uh, Mozzie and Miso uh, and Power obviously have to go where they go. Um, and the other ones are determined by the sketch. Um, and let me just go over to a demo sketch here. So the getting started example basically just or sends data from one radio to the other. It bounces it back to the first one and the first one displays it on the serial monitor. Um, so let's uh, see if we can figure this library out. So we've got a couple of includes SPI, which is the Mozzie Meso uh, serial connection and the RF24 library, obviously. So these example sketches have all the code for both radios in them and you just define them one radio is radio 0 and one radio becomes radio 1 um, radio 1 I think is the one that uh, does the transmit and then waits for the signal to bounce off radio 0 and comes back and then displays it so uh, what do we got here Oh yeah, uh, hardware configuration. This is important. Um, the Mosey, Meso, and Clock are always going to be on pins. What is it? Uh, 11, 12, and 13 uh, on a Nano or an Uno. Um, 
enough just the way the hardware is defined. And then the other two, CSN and CE, uh, you can define them in the library. So that's, I guess, how you can have multiple NRF modules connected to a single Arduino, maybe. I'm not going to go there. Uh, that's, that's my guess. Uh, but anyway, so in this case, uh, we're defining those two as pins 7 and 8. Um, so then in the uh, in the code here because it's got both radios in it roll, radio roll 0 is this code here and radio roll 1 is setting is in the loop uh, rolls, er, roll 0 does this stuff it sets up the stuff for the uh, serial port or for the uh, serial monitor and then radio begin which is part of that RF24 uh, it sets the transmit power to low assuming that you're going to be just messing with this on a bench like I am right now so you don't need high power um, but there are I think four different power levels you can set to max and low are the two opposite ends and then there's a couple in the middle these names I can't remember right now uh, but it's not important um, so we're doing if the radio um, so if the, oh if the radio is one you open a writing pipe if the if the radio is zero you open a, a reading pipe and then but if that's not correct then you do the opposite um, you tell the radio to start listening which is receiver on transmitter off and then in the ping here so in the ping out roll um, stop listening, aka start transmitting, tell the serial monitor now sending. So I'm not exactly sure how this command works. The code guys in the crowd I'm sure can correct me and laugh at me. But as I understand it basically it does this radio dot write and then send the time um, and the number of bits being the size of it. I guess the size of the time and if that doesn't happen then you print failed interesting way of doing it anyway, after you've sent then you start listening aka stop transmitting and wait um, meanwhile the other the other radio uh, rule zero um, does what do we do here? Oh, it's already been set to start listening up there. So it uh, waits for the radio to become available, I guess, uh, set up at the beginning. Once it's available, read the incoming. Oh, I guess that's when it sees the signal from the other radio. Okay. Uh, read the signal, the incoming, uh, read it as time, then stop listening, aka start transmitting, and then write to the radio the time back so that is the same time that is the time that the original one sent it um, and then start listening again and print on its serial monitor the that it sent a response and then this guy wants here the first one is listening and it uh, once it receives it there it is it's listening it receives it it uh, prints out its messages time that it sent it, the fact that it got the response, the, uh, and the round trip delay and stuff like that there, which is calculated up here. Long and short of it, it's just basically proving that they're working and I guess you can, ah, actually I will. Um, once I get this pinging and ponging back between each other, I'll put one of them on a battery and wander off just to see how far it works. Yeah, yeah, I will do that. Okay. But first, to upload the sketches. So the connections that I've made between here, I talked about them a little bit when I was looking at the code, but uh, we have the, where is it here? We have the CE on seven, the CSN on eight, nothing on nine, Mozzy Miso on, uh, on 11 and 12, and the clock on 13. Um, they're not quite in the order that they appear here, but that's just the way it has to go. 
Um, and again, this the CE and CSN, you can define them wherever you want. The mozzie, meso, and clock have to be there. And of course, we've got power coming from there. All right, power. Um, so these Arduino Nanos are 5 volt versions. There are 3.3 volt versions available. I happen to have the 5 volt versions. The NRF modules run on 3.3 volts. These clever little guys have, in addition to the pins and stuff, a regulator, a 3.3 volt regulator. So it's taking the 5 volts, bumping it down to 3.3. It's got some filtering and smoothing capacitors on there. Also acting as a bit of a reservoir capacitor because this thing creates some some uh, sort of pulsy power demands. So you generally want those just to smooth it out a little bit. And then it's got a little resistor and an LED. The LED just tells you that you got power. Okay, so I guess I shall... I've already decided that this one over here is going to be zero. This one's one. And I've loaded the sketch into zero, so we'll load the sketch into one. Can you see it clicking and clacking there a little bit? Okay, now then, so I'm going to leave one connected to the computer. And I'm going to put in zero. I've got plugged into my USB power strip on the side there. Meanwhile, back at the computer. So here is uh, what the script is throwing up onto the serial monitor. This is coming out of radio one. So if I hit T and enter, so it's sending the time, getting the time back, and calculating the delay, which is fairly similar. Now then, I'm I'm going to sh uh, unplug radio zero, and you'll see there's nothing happening there now. I'm just going to disentangle my cables a little bit. Now I'm going to plug, I'm going to plug radio zero into a battery. And there we have our ping pong, ping pong back. Now I'm going to take radio zero for a little bit of a walk. Remember they're on low power, so I'm not quite sure how far I'm going to get here. I'm just going to go for a walk out of the basement. We'll see what happens. All right. That's about as far away as I can get in the basement. And... Well, we're getting some back but not many okay uh i'm gonna bring that one back and we'll turn it to high power and see what happens okay so i've got everything plugged back in again start the serial monitor okay so this is radio one still but now they're both set to high power transmit same as before. Okay, now I'll take my portable one to the other end of the basement. And... Oh, it's better. There was a few packets uh, lost back there, but that was, I think, when I was kind of standing between them. So this is 25 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, I don't know, a couple of walls in between. I've never actually measured my basement. Hmm. But that's relatively reliable, not perfect. But that's with the low power units too. Um, let me just swap in the high power units here. Let's see what happens. Actually, let's just swap in one. It's got a better antenna. Realistically, there's not much difference, except for this one's got a better antenna. I mean, they're completely interchangeable. So now here we have the higher power unit with the antenna on 
the one connected to the computer, and just the more basic one at the far end of the basement. That's more reliable alone. I guess the extra antenna also helps the receive side. That's useful information. So if I'm making, oh, I don't know, a remote control car or something with this, I could have the antenna on my handheld remote control and just leave the other one internal on the mobile unit. That's kind of cool. I wonder what other demo sketches there are here. Hmm. I guess we could look at the data sheet for the NRF 24L01, which is basically just the chip, the name of the chip um, that's on that board. There's not much else surrounding it. Anyway, it's a uh, radio that operates on 2.4 to 2.435 gigahertz. Um, it is configurable up to 2 megabits per second, but the faster you go, the um, the shorter range you have to get reliability, like pretty much any digital radio system. It has 126 possible channels, so you can uh, you can select the channels. And actually, that maybe is an experiment that I should do. Yeah, so here's here's another one of the demo sketches that came with it. It's a channel scanner. Um, because 2.4 gig is free and clear for anybody to use for any kind of thing, including Wi-Fi, um, you may get some interference on some of the channels. So, this one just scans the channels and tells you what you, what's available. So set it up on pin 7 and 8 again, same pins I've got it set up for right now. S number of channels to scan, 126. A setup. Um, doo -doo -doo. Do, what do we got here? So start listening, stop listening. Interesting. Wonder why we would do that. Whatever. Um, again, that's just set. Uh, it says get it into standby mode. Okay. So we do a radio. Or we set up a loop. We do a radio set channel. Listen for a little while. Do we have a carrier? If radio test carrier true, and drop it into into values, um, and then print it out and carry on. Okay, well that's easy enough. Upload. Done uploading serial monitor. So here is a header that it's printed out. It's transmitting at max, which doesn't really matter. It's data read is set for one megabits per second. And here are the channel numbers. 0001 all the way up to 0F um, and all the way up to 7D. So it's printing it out in hex, whatever. Um, but you can see that these first uh, dozen or so channels are available. And then there's a whole bunch that it's seeing some stuff on, which is probably my Wi-Fi in the house here. But then when you get up to C3 or to 3C, 3D area, it gets nice and clean again. And for this experiment, I'm using the NRF that actually has the antenna on it, so it's going to pick up more than if I was using the low power one. So this is interesting. As long as I I can either specify the channel to use, or if I don't specify it, I believe it uses 0, 0. I'll have to check on that. But that is a clean channel where I am, so that's good. Let's try and actually do something useful with this, shall we? Examples. RF24 usage. What LED remote? So this one puts a button on one unit and a LED on the other one. Fairly basic. Sure, turn on a light. Um, so this one, for whatever reason, sets it up on pins 9 and 10 for the CE and CS rather than, what was the other one, on 7 and 8, I think? That's odd. Okay, I'll have to remember to move the pins. Um... Oh, and analog 4 is the roll. P4 
pin. So ground it to be the receiver, which is the one with the LED on it, and leave it open to be the transmitter. Okay, so I upload the same sketch to both boards. That's cool. Um, so what else? Yeah, it's just doing that. Oh, and you can put a bunch of LEDs on for this one. Okay. On pins 2 through 7. Right, okay, that's cool. Um, so I think I mentioned earlier, and if I didn't, these things need a defined radio pipe between them. Uh, basically, it's just a variable that has to match on either end so that they can handshake. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. This one is using an interesting string, but it could be anything. Um, but in this case, it's using this. It just has to match on both ends. It doesn't really matter what it is. Okay, so now that I've loaded that sketch, uh, what is it called, LED remote, into these two boards. Again, it's the same sketch. The thing that determines whether it's a transmitter or receiver is this grounded uh, pin A4. It makes it the receiver. The only thing I have to do left is, uh, if you remember in the sketch, it defined the... Uh, the SPI pins, the uh, CE and CS, as 9 and 10 instead of 7 and 8. So, I have to move those two guys over on both boards so that the chip enable actually works. Okay, so that should theoretically do it. I've just got these both powered in there. So I've got them both plugged in just into my power bar, into my USB power bar. And let's move that out of the way. So there's no computer involved right now, now that they're loaded. So uh, button one turns on LED one, two, three, and four. That's pretty cool. So that way, and there are actually uh, two more buttons defined, but I just didn't feel like digging out more buttons and more LEDs but that's that's pretty slick and that's actually useful now I got a four button remote control because of course these could be anything and actually it's defined as a six button remote control but these LEDs could be you know any output you want um, it could be driving a relay it could be turning anything you want on and off right that's just hardware that's easy okay so the only other thing that I would like to get out of these before I start, well actually, and the project that I'd really like to do with these involves a remote control, but also it involves being able to control a servo or a motor, which obviously is going to need an H-bridge or something like that. Um, the servo, just to have a servo. And those two guys, I'd like to have controlled off analog. Um, that's a couple pots, maybe. Okay. Uh, so what else am I? What else do I need to make this happen? Well, I've got to. Now I've got to actually go and do some research in software. Figure out how to do how to send analog values rather than just uh, on offs over the air. Uh, that's going to take a little bit of figuring. I'm hoping that I don't have to resort to uh, bringing in my teenager to do the code again. At some point, i got to figure this stuff out for myself. Okay, the experimentation continues. So now what I've got is two pots over here on analog 0 and analog 1. And the code in this one basically takes those and transmits them. I'll show you that in a minute. It's nine, no, it's, Actually, this is not at all my code. This one is about 98% somebody else's code and 2% my code. Um, so this just transmits two analog values over to here. This one receives those two analog values, uh, throws them out to the the uh, console, the serial console, and at the same time comes the part that I've added, 
I've added two analog writes um, on what is it, digital pins five and six over to these two LEDs here. So when I turn the pots, the LEDs do variable brightness. Okay, that's cool. But now that I've got that, I also have this motor connected through this little H-bridge kind of sort of motor driver. And I'll plug that into the white LEDs port. I'll hold this so it doesn't get out of the hand. And I now have a variable speed PWM controlled motor. And it's, well, these things aren't horribly torquey. What just happened? One of my pins just came out. Oh no. What just happened? I've lost communication. Let's restart that one. Hmm. Okay, it's not perfect. But it's pretty good. I don't know if that was the radio's fault or me wiggling my wires. But that's kind of cool. So let's... Uh... Actually, I'm going to go away again and see if I can figure out how to add the servo into this mix. I should be able to. It's uh, servo is not that hard a thing to add in. I will be back again. Time has passed. Additional hardware and software has been hacked. So, nothing's changed on this transmitter board. It is still just two knobs, uh, two pots going into the two analogs, zipping across the radio to the other radio. Nothing's changed with two LEDs. This uh, motor is still on, uh, what is that, A6, I think it is. Yeah, A6, or uh, sorry, uh, Digital 6, which is a PWM pin. And the white LED is still connected with that. Uh, pin 5, which is also PWM, is connected to that. All I've added is some servo stuff that I copy and pasted out of the servo, one of the servo demo sketches. And added this servo on pin 3, which is another PWM pin, which I think you need for the servos. Um... And it is grabbing the same data as the blue LED. It's just mapping it down to 180. Actually, there is mapping anyway happening. Um, I'll, I'll show you that later. Anyway, so the motor and the white LED still work. As expected. And now the blue LED and the servo go together with that pot. So that is getting really close to a remote control for like a, a remote control car or a robot or something, isn't it? You could add a second pot for the second wheel um, or have, a, have, I suppose, a joystick and some steering logic. Uh, joystick's just two pots anyway. So... What do we got? There's up to seven, eight analog inputs on here. So I can control eight different things analogly, uh, be they servos or motors on the receive side. Um, and I could also add a few push buttons on this guy to just control binary on offs using the code from before. That's slick. Okay. Now, I'm just going to go over quickly to this code that I, like I said, 90% ripped off and 10% copy and paste ripped off from something else. And I will, yeah, I'll talk to you over at the computer. So first of all, this is the website that I grabbed the basis of this code from. Um, I guess I'll put a link down below for that. It's basically just controlling two analog uh Actually, it's not even controlling analog anything. It's just reading two analog joysticks and transmitting them. Um, and there's the transmitter and receiver code. I did do a little bit of tinkering to it just because there's a few places where... Where was it here? Uh, where the comments were gibbled. That might have just been from my copy and pasting, though. I'm not sure. 
head. Where I added an analog right on pin 5, which is the blue LED in this case, um, and I just mapped what's coming in off the joystick from 0 to 1024, and it should have been 1023, but it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter that much, practically. Um, and then I mapped that down to 0 to 255, because 255 is the maximum, the, the maximum PWM that we can do did the same thing for pin 6 which is the white LED and then I also plugged in my um, my motor driver into the same pin and it's just taking PW as well then the servo I mapped joystick uh, or joystick array 0 is variable again from 1024 but this time down to 0 to 180 because that's what servos do so this is my ugliness in the loop and everything else was in that stolen, uh, stolen code. Okay, well, I hope you uh, got something useful out of there and didn't get just more confused than when you started. I had fun doing this. Uh, this spanned over quite a few hours because there was a lot of stuff happened while the camera was paused, all this playing with wires and stuff. I mean, if you want to watch somebody plugging in wire, plugging wires in and out of a breadboard endlessly, I can do that video if you really want. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you guys coming to my channel and checking out what I'm doing in my shop. Um, if you have anything to say, complaints about my code, questions, things I didn't explain clearly, because I'm sure there's a lot of that. Um, please feel free to drop by the comments down below. I will talk to you later.